faith isn't a blind leap. It's a reasonable step based on good evidence. In some ways, faith is more like a journey. thing to have a relationship which starts off as a friendship for so many years. I met Nikki first um, and then it was my instigation. I was with a friend and I wanted to go to a nightclub, that, a place where we hung out all the time. We, um, sort of teenagers, end of any evening we would go to this place called Francoise at the end of the King's Road and um, we thought it was cool and fun. But you needed to be a member to get in. So I was with somebody else who happened to be a great friend of Nikki's. And so um, she said, oh, well, why don't you ring Nikki up? And he'll get you in. Bit of a cheek, I think. But I rang him up and said, um, hi, will, uh, you know, can, can you get us into Francoise tonight? He said, sure, come round. Now, looking back, I think it's the most bizarre way to behave. <laughs> Nikki's second term at university, he became a Christian. But I didn't know really anything about it. Um, and then I re-met Nikki at a party. I was, I was really excited about what I discovered in my faith, but I was just very insensitive in the way that I went around telling people. I wanted everyone to know, and I thought, right, I'm going to go up to the first person on the, the dance floor, and I didn't want to waste any time with polite conversation. So I, I just went up to Pfeffer and I said... That I looked awful and really needed Jesus. So I thought he'd gone mad. Um, and as you can imagine, that, that put her off for a very long time. And when she did finally become a Christian, it was through somebody totally different. And never, we never thought, there was nothing sort of romantic between us. It was, I was just her friend, advisor. I used to give her advice about her boyfriends. <laughs> Nikki was the safe person to be with. You know, and, and a sort of wise friend. And that was... I, I guess that was wonderful. That's why we could get so close and really. But it changed for me at the Mabel, which was when uh, we had this big party at the end of um, my time at university. And someone else had invited Pips to the Mabel. And we just started talking. And then we started dancing. And then we started playing tennis at six o'clock in the morning and, um, and punting, on punting the down the river. and. Um, and then we held hands, and I thought that was it. You know, for me, that was like, we're going out now. <laughs> I knew something had changed. A new life had begun. Becoming a Christian is an exciting adventure. St. Paul wrote, those who become Christians become new persons. They are not the same anymore, for the old life is gone, a new life has begun. So what makes someone a Christian? Well, some people say, well, I believe in God, or I grew up going to church every now and then, but that doesn't make you a Christian. There are many people in the world who believe in God but wouldn't call themselves Christian. Some people might say that they are really a Christian person because they're nice. Well, lots of atheists are nice people too, but they wouldn't want to be known as Christians because they're not. Some say, I'm a Christian because I was born in a Christian country. But being born in a Christian country doesn't make you a Christian any more than being born in McDonald's would make you a hamburger. A Christian is really a Christian, someone who follows Jesus Christ someone who has a relationship with God through Jesus. What is faith to me? Um, faith. Faith, I think, is a combination of confidence and peace. Yeah, faith. Um, sorry, not yet. <laughs> These are really good questions. Trust. Um, I'm confirmed if that helps. I am CNE Anglican, which means I go to church for my grand on Christmas and Easter. Believing without seeing. He also has faith in me that their next step after this interview will it's be food. Yeah. I don't think faith has to do with religion. I don't know. I don't know how to describe faith. It is believing in something that even that you haven't seen it yourself. Something that gets you through the day.
Everyone's journey to faith is different. Some people know the exact time and place they became a Christian. Other people would say, do you know what? I can never remember a time that I wasn't a Christian. Others would say, well, there was a time when I wasn't a Christian and I know I'm a Christian now, but I couldn't tell you exactly when it happened. It was a bit of a process. What matters is that you know that you've arrived, that you know that you're a Christian now, and you can know that. What does it mean to have faith, to be a Christian? In John's Gospel, it's put like this, yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. St. John is saying there that this is the closest possible intimate relationship of love. It's like a parent and a child. In other places, it talks about being like a lover or, or a friend. Sometimes in the New Testament, there's even the analogy of a husband and a wife. It's that close, intimate relationship. And if you are married, you know that you are married. And if you're a Christian, you can know that you're a Christian. God wants you to be sure of that. St. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. You can know that you're a Christian, you can know that you're in that relationship, and you can know that you have eternal life. So what is this faith, this confidence based on? It's a step of faith based on evidence. It's based on facts, not feelings. If you ask me to provide evidence of how I know I'm married to Pippa, I could show you my marriage certificate. Beyond my obvious love for her, it proves that Pippa and I are married. And if you ask me how I know I'm a Christian, I would point to a document, the Bible, the Word of God. Our knowledge of God is based on the promises of God. In Romans 10, 17, Paul says, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the Word of God. You may have experienced this already gradually on Alpha as you've listened to the talks and discussed in your groups. That was my experience. As I read the Bible, I became convinced it was true. Faith for me came through hearing and hearing through reading the Bible. The Bible's a way that we interact with God. We'll look at that in more detail later in the series. But you can read the Word of God and begin to put it in practice. For example, one promise that Jesus gives is in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Jesus says this, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Holman Hunt, the pre-Raphaelite artist, illustrated this verse with a painting. It's called The Light of the World and it hangs right here in St. Paul's Cathedral. Jesus, the light of the world, stands at a door which is overgrown with ivy and weeds. The door represents the door of someone's life. This person has never invited Jesus to come into his or her life. Jesus is standing at the door and knocking. He's awaiting a response. He wants to come in and be part of that person's life and eat with them. Eating together is a sign of friendship and Jesus offers that friendship to everyone who opens the door of their lives to him. Apparently someone said to Holman Hunt that he'd made a mistake. They said to him, look, you've forgotten to paint a handle on the door. No, he replied, that's deliberate. There is a handle, but it's on the inside. In other words, we have to open the door to let Jesus into our lives. Jesus is not going to force his way into your life. He gives you the freedom to choose whether to invite him into your life. But his promise is this. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Not I might come in or I'll think about it. You can be sure that if you invite him, he will come in and he will always be with you now and for eternity. That's his promise, it's his word. How do I know I'm married? Of course I have my wedding certificate, but I could also point to an event that took place on the 7th of January, 1978, our wedding day. If you ask me how I know I'm a Christian, I could also point to an event in history. 
the death and resurrection of Jesus. I really struggle to understand how the death of Jesus could have made a difference to my life. Someone explained it to me like this, using a verse in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 3, 53 and verse 6, which says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. And the person explaining it said this, said, let this hand represent you and me, and let this book represent all the things that you and I have done wrong. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. The things that we do wrong cut us off from God. We see that they cause a partition between us and God. Jesus Christ, on the other hand, never did anything wrong. He lived a pure life. There was always a perfect relationship between him and his Father in heaven. He's the only man who's ever lived 100% pure life. What the verse says is, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And it goes on to say this. But the Lord, that is God, has laid on him, that is on Jesus Christ, on the cross, the iniquity of us all. What Jesus was doing on the cross was bearing my sin and your sin instead of you and me. But do you see where that leaves us, you and me? We're free to have a relationship with God. Some people say, I don't think I could become a Christian because I'm not good enough. There's loads of things I need to sort out first. But that's not how it works. You come exactly as you are. It doesn't matter what you do or what you achieve. It's about what has been done for you by Jesus on the cross. You can receive total forgiveness and you receive it as a gift. St. Paul writes this, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm sometimes a bit cynical when I hear about a free gift. I always think there's gonna be a catch. But eternal life is a free gift unlike any other. It's totally free for us, and there's no catch. But there is a cost. It costs Jesus his life. And we receive this gift through repentance and faith. Repentance is changing our minds and turning away from the bad stuff in our lives. And faith is putting our trust in Jesus. I remember growing up, in a house where I would jump on my kitchen table and I would see this white powder and I didn't understand what that was and I remember hearing gunshots and growing up in an environment that uh, became normal to me. When I was a little boy being brought up in drug cartels and having a family that was connected to the mafia, seeing drugs everywhere around me, then losing a fiance and then ending up in federal prison and for me that was my bottom. That was the end of my road. I didn't know how to get out of this, and I could only turn to Jesus. And here I was in this situation, but I knew that God could redeem me. And so I began to make changes in prison. The moment that I accepted Jesus, it wasn't that I changed who I was. It was that I accepted who I was, and I became who He wanted me to be. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. And now, seeing my life being redeemed, the story of redemption, that now I have a beautiful wife, I have a son, and I get to be part of a community of faith, hope, and love. In one sense, we all exercise faith every day. If you're sitting on a chair, then you're exercising faith right now. You don't know how that chair was made or who made it, but you trust that it won't give way beneath you. Faith is trust. Yeah, and you can't prove mathematically or scientifically that there is or isn't a God. Belief both in the existence and the non-existence of God requires faith. To be a Christian is to have faith in Jesus, to trust a person. I have a document, my marriage certificate, an event in history, my wedding day. But then there's another piece of evidence that I'm married that I can point to is the experience 
of being married to Pippa for the last four decades. And if you ask me how I know that I'm a Christian today, I can point to decades of experience. And that comes from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of Jesus who comes to live within you. The Holy Spirit, Jesus talks about being like the wind. You can't see the wind, but you know it exists because you see its impact and its power. Most of us naturally fear change. You may be thinking, if I become a Christian, what will that mean for my life? But the change we're talking about is good. St. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Being a Christian doesn't mean you're better than anyone else, but hopefully it means you're better than you were. For me, I found when the Spirit of God came to live in my life, it began to change me. It began to change the way I related to God, to Jesus. I belong to a club where I uh, mainly play squash, but it's also a gym. And over the years, I've got to know the guys down there, and they're, they're mainly taxi drivers, scaffolders, builders. There's a male stripper who's become a good friend of mine. <laughs> uh, and uh, we all have nicknames for each other. They call me Nick the Vic. Uh, <laughs> and one time I was, quite recently, I was chatting to one of the guys down there, and he said to me, so, so how many people come to your church on Sunday? So I said, oh, about 5,000 people. He said, Jesus! I said, yeah, that's why they come. It's all about <laughs> Jesus. Before I was a Christian, to me, like to him, the word Jesus was a swear word. But the moment I became a Christian, the word Jesus, that's a friend. And then the way that I related to other Christians. Before I was a Christian, I thought, these Christians, they were so weird. I mean, at the university I was at, they used to have porridge parties. <laughs> I mean, who goes to a party and sits around eating porridge? <laughs> but then I became a Christian and I went to a porridge party. <laughs> and the people there became my friends. And still, decades later, some of them are really good friends. And the way that I related to everyone, I felt a new love for people, people I never met. But for the poor, for the prisoners, I just felt a love for other people. So there were objective changes that took place in my life. But there was also a subjective experience of the Holy Spirit. St. Paul says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. How long have we been married now? Thirty... There we go, Pip, see if you know. <laughs> Good test. Almost 35, so 37, is that right? 37 years. When um, our first child came along, we were hardly prepared for the arrival of our eldest son, Henry, when he arrived. Overwhelmed the moment he was born by this incredible love, just thinking, I love him, I love him. Just as well when they scream all night and you're so exhausted, you still get out of bed every time. You still go to them, you still pick them up and look after them and nurture them and love them. And that, I mean, if God loves us more than that, then that is a huge amount of love. Um, love is, is, you know, selfish and failing in so many ways, but there's still there's the instinctiveness to love is so profound and deep. No, and it's amazing that, that the Bible uses the analogy of a parent and a child, that God loves us more than any parent loves a child. I think it's so powerful that God loves us even more than that. And you can see it in friendship too, you know, the friendships, the love that you have for your friends, because that's another analogy that is used in the New Testament. Jesus says, I've called you friends, and God loves you. Jesus wants to be a closer friend to you than any friend that you have. That is just a picture of how much God loves you and God's friendship. If you are, have a good model of marriage, that gives you an insight into God's love for you. If you have a good mo model of parent-child, 
either from your own parents or through your love for your, your children or through it can be watching someone else. You don't necessarily have to experience it for yourself, but you can see in a, in a very close marriage, you can see, wow, they really love each other, and God loves me even more than they love each other. Mm. St. Paul says, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, that you are loved more than any parent loves their own children. That's how much God loves you. And he wants you to know that deep in your heart. He wants to testify with your spirit that you are a child of God, loved by him. That's a deep, personal, inner conviction of the Holy Spirit. We have now four grandchildren. And please forgive me telling you a story about my grandchild. Someone once said to Winston Churchill, Have I told you about my grandchildren? Winston Churchill said, no, you haven't, and I'm very grateful for that. (laughs) (laughs) So if you'll forgive me telling you a story about our eldest grandson, Albie. Uh, I remember when he was two years old. Of course, Johnny and Tara adore their children. They adore Albie. Albie adores his parents. But sometimes he, he just really wants to feel close. And Johnny must sometimes be, he just puts up his hands like this, and he goes, Hugger Dada, Hugger Dada. And Johnny picks him up and he holds him. And there's that feeling of closeness, intimacy, the experience of being loved, being hugged. And that's what the Holy Spirit does with us. Sometimes we experience, He testifies with our spirit. We feel hugged by God, loved by God held by God. That's the experience, the subjective experience of God's love. God wants you to know that you are his child, that you are loved, that you are in a relationship with him. And if you're not sure that you are in that relationship, I want to pray a very simple prayer which you can echo in your heart. Some of you might say, well, I'm not ready to do that. There's plenty of weeks to go in this course. But if you would like to, here's a very simple prayer that you can echo in your heart. It's a prayer saying sorry, turning away from the bad stuff in our life, thanking Jesus that he died for us on the cross, and inviting him, opening the door of our heart and saying, come in. So if you'd like to, perhaps uh, let's take a moment and we'll say, a prayer which you can echo in your heart. Let's pray. Here's the prayer. Picture Jesus as he is. He's here right now, and he's standing at the door of your heart, and he's knocking. And if you want to invite him in, here's a prayer which you can pray. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you that you love me so much. I now turn away from all the bad stuff in my life. And if anything comes to mind that you need to ask his forgiveness for, ask now. And then just say, thank you, Jesus, that you died for me so I could be forgiven and set free. I now receive your forgiveness. I put my trust in you. And I ask you to come into my heart by your Holy Spirit to be with me forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.